So welcome everybody to the first episode of Sad Jams, uh, brought to you by We're Trying Records. Um, just a little thing I'm trying to do to spread some love to the DIY scene. Um, and today we have Bo Harris from Old News. Um, hey. And a little bit about Old News before we start. Um, it's composed of jazz school graduates from the emo scene and emo scene veterans. Um, their mathy pop sound exploded into the Midwest indie scene with three back-to-back -back EPs. Uh, they consisted of Consolation Prize, Castro, and Hands Like Glaciers. Um, after touring the U.S. before all the, the pandemic happened, they were opening for scene darlings like Elephant Gym, The Obsessives, Perspective, A Lovely Hand to Hold. And after a run of national tours, um, they decided to get themselves into the studio and finish up their debut LP, Self Acceptance Speak, which is out on October 15th of this year. Right on. So welcome, Bo. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. It's, it's great to be here. Yeah, um, appreciate you taking the time. I know it's late where you're at and you're outside bumming the internet from the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, just right across the street. <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to dive in. Um, as mentioned, you're working on a new album, uh, Self-Acceptance Speech, coming out in October. Yeah. Um, and the first single, he Heads Like Projectors, is coming out on the 18th of September through us. Yep. Um, based off a lot of interviews that I've been reading about past projects, um, a lot of, a lot of um, authors have been saying that the, this huge like jazz sound has been coming from a lot of your projects. Um, and you even made sure to mention that in the bio that we have. Um, mm. So I just wanted to say like, how, how did you get from jazz to alternative emo music? Like how, like that, that's a unique sound that not a lot of people have. I'm just like wondering how you thought like you could, you could combine the two to make something special. Sure. And that's such, that's such a great question. Um, so, I, the, the band is uh, myself, uh, our drummer Max, and our bass player Blaine, and the three of us met um, not in the rock world, but we all met as jazz musicians. So I was playing with Blaine in like a jazz trio, and I was playing in this weird avant-garde percussion group with Max, and like, you know, we just, we knew each other from like, you know, because when you do music school, like you're playing scholarship for everything, and so we ended up bumping into each other at like, all these different like gigs and, and shows and stuff and like one thing if you ever get the chance to meet Max and Blaine they're just sweeties like they're so fun to talk to and like um so what, what we found is like whenever we were in non like academic settings or non performance settings we were just like jamming a lot and it was all just kind of indie rock like Max his other band is like a death metal band that rules like the guy has chops you know so i was like where's this intersection between like really heavy metal and jazz music and for us that was like really fucked up indie rock i guess um you know so when whenever we did our first record like it was just kind of a matter of of for us, it's not so much like there's not the same like improvisational element that is, you know, the back backbone of jazz, but we love those voicings. And so like our whole jam as a band is like subverting kind of genre expectations. Yeah. So like taking a pop song and making it a five or like replacing a power chord with like some really crazy jazz thing. And so we just got really interested in that idea and then kept doing it and kind of made that the backbone of, of our sound. Nice. Did So like a lot, of, like you said, like jazz is like super interpretive. It's just jamming. Is that like, mm. is that how like a lot of your songs come about or is it just like, I, I'm Total not opposite. And I've never, <laughs> I've never made a track or anything like that. So it's just like, I'm mm -hmm. just like how all these wonderful sounds come about, you know? So we, like for meeting as jazz musicians like old news is probably the least improvised music ever <laughs> um so like our kind of our kind of writing process in in general um but especially for the new record what we kind of started off by doing is we would we did a lot of this virtually uh remotely um max and blaine live in wichita kansas and i live outside of kansas city kansas or missouri um 
And so we would kind of take these really simple ideas. Like, I mean, I'm talking like four or five chord acoustic guitar songs. Um, and then I would email them over to one of them. And then they would be like, this is good or this is the worst. And uh, so from there, we, we would just, we would start with something super simple and we would try to make it as complicated and noodly and abstract as, as we could. And then we simplify it back down. Okay. Um, so we'll like the stuff that's on self-acceptance speech is like the most popified version of those compositions. And, um, but generally, yeah. So we'll start with like something pretty simple harmonically and then we'll practice like chord substitution. So we'll be like, this is a really big power chord moment here. What's like a more colorful thing that we can use. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we'll go through and kind of rewrite and rearrange these compositions uh, to have like a little bit more interest and dynamic. And so that's kind of like where we start and then we'll, we'll get together in one room whenever something is like halfway sketched out and we'll yeah. finish it from there. Yeah. I mean, just like listening to your your past, your late your last EP, um, Hands Like Glaciers, that was worked on by TJ Lippel, Lippel, if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. right. Uh, but he did like Fugazi, American Football, uh, Look Mexico, um, and then this record you had John. Oh, I'm gonna butcher this one. Nuclear Nucleretto. Uh, I think it's Nasalirio. Nasalirio. And I'm probably I'm I'm probably butchering it too. Uh, apologies, John. Um, but he did like Sorry, John. He did some My Chemical Romance albums. He did Microwaves, mm -hmm. Much Love, just to name a few. Um, is there like did they give you any pointers? Like I'm not like again I'm not aware of this whole process. Like do, what's the interaction sure. between you and like how did it shape? Your last EP compared to this one, just working with two like heavy hitters of like the EA, yeah you know, DIY scene like those are some like amazing amazing bands um so with TJ uh when with the project that we did with him the music was really it's it's one of the more classical like midwest emo projects that we've done yeah I was gonna and I was gonna say yeah, like, go ahead, go ahead. listening to it like it brought me back to like some of like my high school days like that sort of like emo indie Whereas like, yeah, man. I've been listening, like I've had the chance to like listen to your full album for a while. And this one's like a lot heavier. Like it reminds me of like some of the newer stuff that I got into in like college and even now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just like a complete, there's like, for like fans who like recognize this, like they'll be able to tell like a little bit of difference. Um, but also like, I feel like the, the message behind like your last EP and this EP are like pretty sort of different. Uh, based off of, like what I've read, yeah. I've heard. Absolutely, and I think that's something where um, I did not want to be a vocalist or a lyricist for this band. I honestly, I just wanted to kind of play guitar. Um, but for the style, there wasn't anyone in in my music community that wasn't already taken with another project. So I kind of had to like fake it till you make it. Yeah. Which I think is that that's such that's such at the heart and the backbone of, of DIY and emo music anyway. Um, so as as I've developed as a lyricist, um, I've tried to stop writing about myself so much. Okay. And I think that like it's still it's highly personal and like self acceptance speech is about like the pursuit of self, mm -hmm. but not necessarily like from behind your own eyes in the same way. Okay. And so I think with with Castro and Hands Like Glaciers, which are our last two EPs, I was really drawing from like a well of pain or like a well of hurt mm -hmm. and using it as like kind of just an outlet to bitch about stuff. <laughs> and I know that that's like, that's not classy to say and it's not like hip or artistically deep, but like for the first two years, like old news was like my outlet for that stuff and as you know we've been really blessed by our music community and others you know by the chance to go and play and so you know we would go out into the states and we would find that like this music was really resonating with people mm -hmm. and it was really 
touching people in like a good way. And when I kind of realized that like this was having an impact on, you know, people's coping ability or like they were listening to it when they needed something, um, as like an author and as a lyricist, like that, that made me stop and like think about like, how is this going to be perceived? Like, how can I get this out of like this angry, oh, <laughs> um, you know, how can I take this out of like this malingering, like kicking rocks, kind of like sad about my nonsense problems to kind of talking on like a bigger scale of like, what does it mean to be mentally healthy? Uh -huh. um, what does it mean to like truly love yourself as a human being and to love others? And I think that that's something that, you know, a lot of emo music deals with, but we deal with it from an I, you, we pronoun heavy kind of frame of reference. And so when we were writing the lyrics, like we, we made sure to sit down and kind of like change the way we were phrasing things and kind of make it have a little bit more of like a hopeful message and a little bit less of a, well, let's just burn this whole thing down. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a place for both. Like, absolutely. I, definitely. Like, like now thinking back to all, like your, your albums and EPs, like I definitely, like I get this sense of, I get what you're talking about. Um, but like, even like people still need the, the bitching about like whatever, because we all get in the, our own heads and stuff like that. So. Absolutely. And there's a fair amount, like, as <laughs> you know, I couldn't take it all out, you know, but it went from being like everything complaining to like maybe like 50%. <laughs> and, and I think that it's made, it was really challenging um, to write that way. And to kind of like, I sat down with all of my lyrics, like, outside of music but just as like poetry and I know that sounds really pretentious but like with my old you know lyrics for the last few compositions and like I was like wow there's I like these to this day okay this song did not age well um <laughs> and so I kind of like identified some just real shortcomings in, in my writing uh that I was consistently unhappy with and kind of sitting down to like work on them from like a written angle and not just like how does this fit into a microphone? Definitely. Um, so it was, it was a much different approach this time around. Wow. That's, that's so awesome. Well, at least like, it sounds like, like you grew between records and hopefully like fans and stuff like can hear that. And like, hopefully they grow like along with it and like understand like the train of thought and like how to get past everything. Absolutely. And one, I owe a lot of gratitude uh, to my dear friend, Joey Lemon. Um, he's with Barry on Sub Pop, um, and Joey, Joey was one of two mixing engineers that we used, and Joey pushed me so hard. Um, like, the guy is an English teacher, he's got a master's degree in creative writing, and so, like, him and I sat down with my lyrics, and I was like, roast me. Like, take this, like, piece by piece, I want you to destroy this. And so we... So we took a little bit of time between like recording the instrumentals and, and starting work on the vocals where like very nicely because he's the sweetest man I've ever met in my life. But like he, he had some notes. Um, yeah, the red and so I, and came out. Huh? Yeah. So it was like having like your professor who was also <laughs> like your mixing engineer. Um, but that helped me a lot. It made me have like a lot of confidence where I wasn't so worried about, man, am I going to think this is dumb? in six months but instead having the confidence to know that like this is going to stand um for a while and being able to like then have the confidence to like express that on a as like a vocalist instead of being in my head about uh these lyrics are kind of dumb <laughs> you know um so like going back to microwave we had you make a little video for us um, oh yeah i don't know where we were going with it but in the spirit of sad jams, we wanted you to make your your most emo saddest sandwich that you absolutely would probably cry after eating. Um, so here it is. We'll just we'll just roll it.
I don't know what to say. Like that, there was a lot of good tunes in it. Like we tried. <laughs> it was well shot. It was well shot. That's not. There's not. It came out better than what I was picturing. So kudos to you on all. Awesome the shows. man. But like, any anything, any of the tracks that you want to call out that. Oh, yeah, man. Um, the amount of times that I've cried my eyes out to like dull or lighterless on <laughs> microwaves much love is like too many. Um, or, um, you know, I think like the jam was was Death Cab's Narrow Stairs, right? And Narrow Stairs is a record that unequivocally changed my life. Um, I was working at a drum shop and I didn't even play the drums at the time. Um, but I like they were playing Great Fine Fires, uh, which is track eight, seven or eight on Narrow Stairs. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. And so this guy I was working with, he was like, yeah, man, like I'll teach you how to play this drum beat. And man, um, that was like a, a turning point for me. Um, and then to kind of revisit that album, you know, hearing it when I was 15, I walked away with something that was really scratching the surface of, I think what Gibbard was trying to like articulate and then going back to it at 20 and then going back to it at 23. Like it's an album that like is good when you hear it, but is even better when you grow up with it. Sure. And so it's been a really powerful record for me. Thinking about like Death Cab, I, I'm gonna, I don't even know, I forget which album it, it's off of, but I think it's uh, what Sarah said. Um, uh, I, I think that's off Transatlanticism. Okay, I was gonna say that, but I didn't wanna be completely wrong. Um, I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was, I was listening to um, Touche Amour's uh, album. Um, oh shoot, it's, it's not their last one, it's the one before it. I'm just like blanking tonight. Um, but it, the whole album basically talks about like how he's in Florida, how his mom passes away and everything like that. And in one of the tracks, he, he mentions like what Sarah said. And I kept hearing that. I'm like, why is that so familiar? And I was like, oh, it's a Death Cab song. Mm -hmm. like, got done listening to the track, went and like listened to that. And I, it just like, it hit me like a thousand times harder. Like just absolutely the context between like what he was thinking and like how it influenced him and like, how I discovered that album when I was in junior high or high school. And like to this day, just like it finally hit me about what it was about and all that good yeah. stuff. And there, that's what I think that's a testament to Gibbard's lyricism and just how timeless that band is. Is like they're still making music. All of them are really not that old. And yet they're consistently like cited as influences for so many people, not even like in the kind of indie genre it's just yeah. good music you know yeah. 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 but now let's like get to your new your new album self-acceptance speech coming out on october 15th and we mentioned that a few times um but just we I always go back to like hands like glaciers just because i've been reading up a lot from like previous mm -hmm. done um and just like listening to the to your previous ep the from the you can correct me if I'm wrong, like this was your like you wrote it everything, but from a listener's point or from my point, it there's a lot of like unsure feelings in it. Absolutely. I don't know who you were, who you were talking to or who it was directed towards. Um, especially with like tangled up. Um, and then we've we've been talking about hands like projectors and self acceptance speech for a while now. Um, and you mentioned in an email to me about hands like projectors. Um, you said it was jaded and more cynical than a lot of the stuff you've written. Mm -hmm. um, and just like a lyric from it was, um, we have lots of digging through the baggage you've been carrying around for 20 years, which like, <laughs> yeah. that just like, boom, just hit me. Um, so That's, like, absolutely. I don't really know what, what the question is, but like what, <laughs> what happened between you're even sure. in this one like if it's, um, if it's like too much like you, you don't have to like no no no, no. I, I'm, I'm so happy to talk about it um so th this this kind of gets into a, a message that we really try to drive home in in our live shows um like our music i think can both 
help heal people, but can also pour gas on the fire, depending on kind of like what mood you're approaching it from. And so, um, you know, we try to maintain like as positive outlook on mental health and like destigmatizing that for the audiences that we play for um, and, and, and both, you know, as an audience thing and also like in private conversation, like, and, and so when Tangled Up came out or um, trying to think like, don't bum me out, like the first, you know, few songs on, on hands, um, like Glaciers, I was going through one of the most challenging times that I have ever kind of had to go through. I was, um, I had just ended a relationship of like two years um, based on like some infidelity with a close friend of mine, which like ruins so much, you know? Um, and I was really, so I was, I was struggling with that on like a surface level, but as like a deeper thing, I was really struggling with my identity, both as a musician and as a person and like how to be a good person right now. And I, I struggled with that for a really long time and I felt um, really unsure and like no pun intended, but I felt very tangled up. You know, that's like where the song came from. And, um, but as I got older and I, during this time I was also moving from Wichita to kind of the Lawrence, Kansas City area. So I was going through like a move across the state and like a new school, new town, new friends, like the whole deal, right? So I felt like so lost in so many ways. And um, so that, that influenced so much on, on hands like glaciers. It was just like this yearning, like looking for anything and get it as I've gotten healthier as a person and as I've, I've spent more time making sure that like my mental state is solid um, and, you know, utilizing some different resources for that. Like it helped tie the lyrics to self-acceptance speech about like accepting that, hey, we don't got it all the time. Mm -hmm. And like sometimes like shit is just so whack and that's all that it can be. But that's cool and that like gets better, you know? Um, and so that's kind of the message for, for the album as a whole, but also like, come on, I gotta complain. I, got, I have to have like some outlet for something. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna give myself like three songs out of 10 where I'm just gonna unashamedly like fuck you complain about stuff. <laughs> and, and so has like projectors for me was like, okay, I'm not gonna be all poetic about this. I'm not gonna try to like make this sound pretty and, and prose. I'm just gonna like vent. And it is cynical and it is jaded. And honestly, it's, uh, it's a pretty dark piece of music. Um, but like, oh man, it feels so good to play. <laughs> it, it, like even, I'm going to guess like another one of the tracks, is it Pulling Teeth was another one? Oh yeah. Okay. That's yeah. A hundred percent. Like you got like, and we were like, okay, we're going to stack this all in the front half of this record. Like <laughs> we're going to get it out of the way. Like, so that way, you know, if someone who's like a, a fan of like contemporary or classic, like emo music, you know, they're going to show up to those first like few tracks and be like, okay, I'm home. Like I know what to expect. And then, you know, we kind of get out of the way and we start talking a little bit less about like, uh, I'm really bummed out or like, uh, I had this really rough breakup or, uh, so like, okay, let's talk about some real shit. Like, let's talk about divorce. Let's talk about like getting to know yourself as an adult with the perceptions of yourself as a child. Like, and but at the same time, like I had to get it out of the way, you know. So we had we had a couple on there that are just like, I mean, both both tracks are like are big, big, like just like big sounding, and it's just mm -hmm. like just straight, just like straight at it. I mean, there's no like beating around the bush with them. Absolutely I'm not. <laughs> like there's a in in pulling teeth. Like now, I'm not necessarily proud of this line, but other people seem to get a lot out of it. Um, in the third verse of Pulling Teeth, it just opens and says, fuck me like you fucked my friends. I, and I, had, like, that, I had that written down, but I didn't, <laughs> like, I didn't want to touch on it. If it came up, like, naturally, like, totally. Fine. Yeah. Um, and, like, that's, like, one of those lines where, like, so we've been playing that song out. That was the first song 
from self-acceptance speech. Like that's part of why it's the opener. It's like the oldest piece from that record. And uh, so you've been playing it for about a year and every single time we get to that part of the song, like I hear exhales or like, ooh, <laughs> like without fail, like we've been all over the country and like almost every time that someone new hears that song, like everyone looks around and is like, can he say that? Is that okay? <laughs> but yeah, just, and then like, I know you just posted like a little something about it on um, Instagram, like you did a playthrough for um, 722 Harder Street. Yep, yep. Um, I think like, what caught me after like listening to it for a while, you had these two street names like back to back. Um, obviously they must have meant something to you. You had sure. different points in your life at some point. Um, I know in, in the Instagram post, you said the 722 Harder Street is from your teen years. Is, mm -hmm. there, is there like like a transition from Cherry Street to Harder Street or? Cause like- Yeah, absolutely. Cherry Street, um, like the full track, like vocals, everything harder streets like it blends into it. it's nice and like sort of melodic but then mm -hmm. harder street just like continues it but then just like unleashes towards the end sure so i grew up in um, a town called winfield kansas and the only thing that is there it's like ten thousand people and they have like a bluegrass festival and that's it um but i i had uh, a pretty tumultuous upbringing there um, so from the time I was, let's say like 12, if maybe a little younger than that, to the time that I left home when I was 17, I had moved 11 different times. Um, so I, and this is all within the same like 45 square miles. So like, it wasn't as, I think, bad as, as some other people have had it, but in other ways, like small town politics and like small town rumor mill like very potent forces and so um like i was living with like i was raised by like a single mom um, and my little sister and i had just experienced like multiple divorces and like really uh not good home situations and so part of my kind of method of dealing with that is like I love compartmentalizing and, and composing based on these locations that these different things happened in. Um, and so there's, yeah, 1917 Cherry Street was like the street address of uh, a house that I lived in and stuff like really blew up uh, towards the end. And then we ended up in Harker Street, uh, which is like about four blocks away. And we were not at Harker Street for very long but thematically, it was like, we were probably, uh, thematically, we were only there for like two months. Um, and the first month was like very serene and calm. And it felt like stuff was like going to kind of end up on its feet. And then that like second month, it did not at all. Um, and so this kind of ties in also with with um, another track that that is the same but just not named the same way um track three jps is uh actually the house i lived in before cherry street oh, wow. um so it has like a street address but it just wasn't it just didn't make a good name yeah yeah like it was like super long and just it didn't work as like a song title um but yeah that that middle that middle half of the record is all about um different houses and experiences that I went through um, when I was growing up from, yeah, when I was about like 13 to when I left home at 17. Man. Yeah, just like coming from like, I'm from a town of like less than a thousand. And okay, yeah. We, I had, I had like one stationary house where my dad lived and then my mom moved around within the town. And mm. like, I'll, I'll still go back today. Like, I was back like last month and you just see like the same, like the houses and stuff. Like one's not even there anymore. It's just like, I don't know. It's, it's weird to see it. And it's weird to like, yeah. Just experience and like the small town rumor mill thing is totally true. It, it's so real. And like, so we, that's, that's why we ordered them on, on the record. You know, it's literally like the street addresses of the houses that I lived in chronologically. 
um, for that middle half. And, and there are, there are other, um, like, there's a lot of houses. There's a lot of songs about those houses. And like, a lot of them didn't make the cut um, for, for this project. I think there's 10 songs in this, but we, I think had like 18 sketches before we kind of like solidified it down. And so there's some other ones, like I think on whatever the next project is, like I'll pick like a fresh batch of like houses and locations and maybe I'll see if I can go visit them, you know, and like record some sounds in there or something. I think it would be really cool, but cool. That, that's a little, that, you know, that's a little ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess like, that's all I have. Like, I know your first, um, your first video and track are coming out on the 18th of September. Um, yep. About to show the video here, premiere it. Um, but yeah, I just want to say, like, do you have like any any words about it? Anything about the the single, the album, anything like that? Yeah. Um, so I'll I would I would love to talk about the the video for Heads Like Projectors. Um, so we uh, you know we have some great relationships with with videographers and like I did video for work for a, a, quite a while and. Um, but with the pandemic, like we couldn't rent locations. Um, and so also like all of our creative friends were already struggling to begin with. So like there just wasn't really, we didn't have the same opportunities to like hire people to make the videos. And so we were like, oh shit, well, we're gonna have to do it ourselves. Much like so much about this band, you know, it's like we try to do as much in house as we can, um, as well as we can. Um, and so Heads Like Projectors is the first video that, that I've directed. Um, and so uh, every single part of that video was shot on a budget of $70. <laughs> um, we literally built soft boxes like out of cardboard and like tin foil and like hung lights in them. And so we shot this video in the back of a garage at the shop that our drummer works at. And so we, you know, kind of, we, I had been uh, just as like a film fan, like I had been kind of on a noir movie kick. And so we were like, well, we've got about $70 and two weeks. So <laughs> what can we do? Um, and so, yeah, everything was, was shot entirely by us. Um, everything was edited by us. Um, and then we, filled in the gaps with uh, some archive footage from the Internet Archive and the Library of Congress, uh, which is, you know, like so much royalty free footage that you, is just free to use. Um, and so we did like a scratch version and we were like, this doesn't look that good, but I bet if we did X, Y, and Z, then it would. So we doubled back around and we like reshot it and it turned out like so much better than, than I could have hoped for, for it being, you know, our first project that we've ever shot and directed and edited ourselves i mean um, i think it looks i think it looks amazing like if you would have told oh, thank me you. that that you made on 70 dollars in a garage <laughs> somewhere i'm like <laughs> i yeah. would never guess that we we like bought a bunch of like pvc pipes to make like a backdrop and like hung like a black bed sheet and like went to town um so we had to be really resourceful you know and and we're hopefully we'll have some some other uh music videos and other video content um but it was really encouraging to us because we were like oh we can do this like at a halfway decent level like let's just keep doing it and see if we can you know as we we have by no means uh, perfected music i think we're just at the point that we're getting like i um so i would like to get just all right with video and i think that if if we as a group can make that happen then you know, it, 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 we yeah. love doing it. And like, yeah. that's such a fun intersection of artistry. And it just allows you to be like more versatile with like your other releases. And like, as you said, like less dependent on like other people and stuff like yeah. that. You do it, like do it yourself, you know? <laughs> sure. And, and it's also like allowed us to pay it forward. Um, and I think that, especially in our community, um, you know, there is all, at, there's sometimes only so much to go around and music videos are not cheap like to get made and we've been really privileged and really blessed that you know we're able to tour and and play shows consistently to kind of finance that but like 
um, some of our friends don't have that same opportunity. So as, as we've tried to kind of develop the skill set, we've been, you know, working with some smaller artists from our community and others to kind of like, hey, you shouldn't have to pay a whack amount of money for a video that doesn't even look good. Like, let's see what we can like, you know, let's see what we can do together to like help you guys make these kind of things. And um, we've gotten a really good reception from that. And that's something that like we get really excited about. And I'm excited to see like some more of those get released. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all about paying it forward and just like sharing the same love that has been shown to us so many times. Definitely. Just like keep building the scene and like, I don't know, especially like in, in Wichita and like Lawrence and everything like that. Like, be amazing to see like more bands come up and like take the spotlight absolutely and like there there are so many that are like i don't know i think I've, i'm pretty privileged because like i follow so many of my friends on instagram they post like little you know riffs and like whatnot but i think after this whole quarantine situation there's gonna be some new projects out of wichita that i think are gonna really really pop off damn awesome i'm excited yeah me too um, man but yeah, so here, thanks Bo for joining us. Um, for Absolutely. Bad Jams interview. Um, and here is the video for Heads Like Projectors. See you later. First and last initial on the dotted line. Pray for insurance. I hope our conversation wins some peace of mind. in my skull go ahead and dim the light so i can see drinking in the twilight to sustain my recollection i'm at peace with my regrets i will drown in self-reflection i am losing to my vices i am lost with no direction bony shoulders start to bend under The city is an anthill when you're staring